Welcome to our Book Reporter Talks to Interview, where our guest is Emma Straub, who we are going to be talking to about her new book, All Adults Here, can't wait to talk about this, which is a Book Reporter Bets on Selection, as were her last two books, Modern Lovers and The Vacationers. I can still remember where I was where I read every one of Emma's books, which is really lovely. I can remember sitting by the pool. I can just remember every single place curled up on the couch. And that's really a mark of a great book because I remember it, I remember character and whatever. Now, the last time I saw her, it was in January and we were in the lobby of a hotel in Baltimore and she was wearing a coat that I covet. It was this beautiful down coat that actually worked well with the book. And I felt that maybe the book shouldn't be pubbing in May. It should be coming out in January. And it's just where the book, the, the coat on book tour. So that's my fashion moment of remembering where you were. And I just want to welcome you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Carol. Um, you know, I have to say, I, I I feel like I have a lot of items of clothing that are like pretty good, you know, mm -hmm. but I have never gotten more compliments about anything than I have my winter coat, which is this bright orange floor length sleeping bag, basically. So I'm, I'm glad you liked it. Yes. It, Very totally happy. coveted. Totally, <laughs> totally coveted. So let's start for, by you telling us a little bit about all adults here. You're like elevator pitch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, it's funny because when I was working on this book, I really thought about it as like telling the story that is like the closest to my life, even though it takes place, you know, in a small town in the Hudson Valley, upstate New York. Um, and I live in, you know, hustly bustly Brooklyn. Um, it really is my experience because it's about a family that's still close together physically and emotionally. Um, it's three generations of this family and they all are sort of tripping over each other all day long and also tripping over themselves, like who they are now, who they were 10 years ago, who they were 20 years ago. Um, it's, you know, the, the, the generation that is closest to me are the adult children um, who have children of their own. And, and I feel like, you know, I couldn't have written this book before because I, I, didn't know, I didn't really understand what it was like to be in this part of the Venn diagram, you know, where I have small children and I have parents who are getting older. And I'm in the middle trying to take care of everybody um, and, and trying to remember that I'm really lucky right now to be in this mm -hmm. spot that I'm in. Um, but yeah, I mean, so basically that was a very long way to answer your question. Basically all adults here is about three generations of family um, and um, making mistakes and messing up and, um, hopefully continuing to evolve as you get older. And they're also doing a lot of wondering about their past, wondering mm -hmm. about what went on along the way. Yeah. In this small town in the Hudson Valley that's called Clapham, which I really love. And why did you decide to set it in that, per that kind of location? Well, so I, you know, I, I really love the Gilmore Girls. Um, and <laughs> it sounds like a joke, but it's true. Um, that I really, I wanted to write a novel that had that same sort of feeling, that same like, you know, here are the, here's the perimeter, like everything is gonna happen inside this space. Um, again, because like really that's, that's how my life is, where I, you know, I live here and my children's school is here and my bookstore is here and I, I really just go in a circle all day long. Um, and I wanted, I wanted to write about what that feels like, you know, about what it feels like to live in the place where you grew up and to interact all day long with people from your past. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's your best friend from middle school or your boyfriend from high school or, um, you know, or teachers or your friends, parents, you know, like those are the people who I see 
all day long. <laughs> um, and I mean, you know, right now, of course, I like, you know, I miss that more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, I think when I was writing this book, I was, I was really sort of wrestling with that, with, with what that feels like. Um, and so, you know, I'm a novelist, so I did what novelists do and I made them wrestle with it instead. <laughs> and they got to meet in upstate in Hudson Valley. Right. You know, back in December, you mentioned that when you first started thinking about writing this book, you were gonna write a book about cheese. <laughs> now, where did this head you in this new direction? Because I just love that line. Probably because I love well, cheese. <laughs> well, I mean, both sides of my family are from Wisconsin. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I love cheese. I really do. Um, and I mean, it sounds so goofy, but it is genuinely that goofy where I had this idea that was about, that was for a book almost totally unlike this book. Um, but just something that was like totally lighthearted, like, and downright goofy. Um, but then when I started writing and, or not, not even actually the writing of the book, but when I started working on my outline and thinking about the characters, it was, it was, it became clear to me, um, that, that the book really was not about cheese, no matter how much I tried. Um, there is cheese in the book. There are goats in the book. Um, and there's some food in the book because I like to write about food, but, but, um, yeah, I, it turned out that I cared more about about the characters and, and, and some like sort of sadder and more like melancholy notes in, in these characters' lives than, than just making it like a romance about a cheese. A romance or a like, lighthearted kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't just gonna be cheesy. It wasn't gonna be like that, you know? Um, you know, I think I was thinking about Kelly Corrigan's book, The Middle, the middle Place, because that's mm -hmm. where you are right now. Like you're just between yeah. those two places. And I was thinking of that so much. Was the title, a given right from the start? Was it always going to be all adults here or was oh, it? You know, it's funny. Titles are tricky for me. Um, and w I didn't have this title until very, very, very late in the process. But, but I think it captures, I don't know, to me, titles are titles and, and book jackets are, are really hard. Um, because they have to do so much work. Um, you know, because someone who might buy a book called All Adults Here might not buy a book called, I don't know, The Book About Cheese or, you know, whatever it was. Whatever it is, yeah. Um, but I think what what All Adults Here does that that I needed it to do is it tells you that something's not quite right, right? Because you don't say we're all adults here. <laughs> Unless, <Exactly. laughs> yeah. Are you right? Like th th there's that question is inherent in the title. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, so is a sense of humor. And I think for me, you know, as I don't think I, I, I don't set out to write like comedies, um, mostly because that seems really hard. Um, but, but I do care that my books are funny, you know, and it, and it matters to me that my characters have senses of humor and are funny with each other and to themselves in their head. Like that, that matters to me because really when you write a book, you have to spend years with these people. And I would rather <laughs> I would rather write a whole book just about cheese right. um, than, than, than write a book about characters who have no sense of humor. Like that just sounds so absolutely deadly boring. Um, and I have no interest in that. In that. So, so, the, so the title needed to, it needed to tell you sort of in, in, a, in a sort of funny way what the, what the problem is in the mm -hmm. book. And, and that's, that's the problem, right? That, that the adults, you know, it's, there's a matriarch who's 68 years old 
and she's behaving in a way that isn't what her adult children expect of her, and then the adult children are each having their problems, and then of course the only sane, rational people in the whole book are the 13-year-olds, because um, that seemed right to me. It just seems completely right. Well, when the book opens, Astrid has witnessed an accident where an empty speeding school bus is at fault and it sort of sets the action for like, you know, what this book is going to be. Like in the first sentence, you're like there. Did yeah. you have that sentence rolling around in your head in a while before you wrote it down? Because it's just this like, this is what ends up happening and you're in there. I mean, you're in with yeah. the comedy of it, even though it's serious. Yeah, yeah. Right away. I, very, to me, it's very, thank you for saying that, Carol, because to me, it's very funny. Um, the opening sentence, a woman gets hit and killed by a school bus and I just, I think it's so funny. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I didn't know, I don't know. It's hard. It's, it's, it's a complicated question because like, it's, it, it's not that, that, the, I guess the scene had, was rolling around in my head. Like I knew what I wanted. I knew I wanted that, um, as the opener, but I'm just, you know, I'm one of those people who, I start at the beginning and then I just go straight till the end for the first draft. Obviously then, you know, after that you have to go in and be like, Oh, let me look at this. Fix it. <laughs> different scenes at different points. Mm -hmm. um, but I do like to start at the beginning. Um, and to me, yeah, that, that, that opening scene really like it, it gets things rolling in a way that I felt good about it. And sometimes Sometimes when I was having trouble later on, it was important to me to think about that, the, the sort of the energy of that scene. Right. Um, because, you know, energy in, in fiction, like, I mean, there's a lot that happens in the book, but it's not at all plot heavy. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, with books like that, which are like, you know, most of mine where it's like families having conversations and hurting each other's feelings, um, you know, you have to, you have to figure out how to maintain momentum because otherwise people are going to be like, why would I, who cares, you know? Um, but if you, you know, if, if there's enough zip, um, people will keep reading. It know. definitely is. So this accident leaves Astrid sort of questioning her whole life. I mean, I just love that she witnesses this that's going on and she wonders, um, did I get it right as a mother? And to me, instead of the book being about perfection, it's really about allowing mistakes. Yeah. Like everybody has to be allowed to make mistakes in life and to look back on it. Yeah. So am I in the right direction? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, it, you know, I mean, I think that that's another reason why I, I couldn't have written this book before. I mean, I had one... I had one child when I wrote The Vacationers. Mm -hmm. um, and then when Modern Lovers came out, I had a two-year-old and a brand new baby. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't really understand yet. And in way, obviously, I'm sure that my thoughts on parenting will continue to evolve as my children get older. You know, they're four and six. So I know that there's a lot still coming down the road. Um, but I think what I, what I, what I understand now that I didn't before is that, you know, perfection is a, is a, is a, not only is it a myth, but it's, it's really not even the goal, you know, that the goal is to adapt and to accept and, and to, 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 to modify as needed. You know, I think that, um, you know, when I had one baby, I read a friend of mine wrote a funny thing about this recently where, you know, where the, about those people who have one, one perfect child mm -hmm. and they'll tell you, Oh, you know, they'll give you perfect advice based on their one perfect child. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I have two children who are definitely not perfect, just as I am definitely not perfect. And my husband is definitely not perfect. And my parents are not perfect. And, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just seeing everything um, with what feels like, you know, sort of freshly open eyes to, to, to what it actually takes to be a good parent. Um, 
Yeah, but it, but it's I mean that you know I I I I worry about my kids and what I'm doing <laughs> by doing the right thing. Well, you know they also say that when you have one child, you have um, I think it's four possible interactions. I think it's four. And somebody says, well, I'm gonna have another baby and it's gonna be double. I said, no, it's gonna be 11. Yeah. <laughs> because they're 11. And that's the reason the number two always makes it feel like, what just happened? How did our lives just explode? I have two also, yeah. one are five years apart, which made it a little easier because somebody could go get a bottle. Somebody right. could go get the car seat. Somebody right. could strap themselves and it was easier. Right. I think that people just are not used to, it's not all going to go like the plan. And especially yeah. these days with social media, everything is so sculpted to be wonderful. And I say, can I just see somebody's kid cry? Yeah. <laughs> it's not all that wonderful. It's not all that perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not, although, you know, I will say like, I've been having a lot of, you know, zoomy, zoomy conversations. Um, I also just spilled my glass of wine. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> not telling <laughs> anyone. <laughs> Um, but you know, I've been having a lot of these zoomy conversations and a lot of the people I've been talking to are, um, either young, you know, very, very young people who may have children, but don't have children yet. And then a lot of other people who are childless and quite happy with that choice, like my friend, Ann Patchett. And, um, and they say to me, they have said to me, so many people have said to me in the last six weeks, oh my God, what a nightmare. I'm so glad I don't have children. Like it must be torture. Are you feeling tortured? And on the one hand, I think that what a very rude thing to say <laughs> to someone, right? But also I think that the fact that I have two small kids who need my constant attention, means that I am not paying constant attention to the news and the newspaper. Mm -hmm. And it actually has made it really nice. Like, I feel like we're in this sweet little- Like a bubble. Yeah, sweet little bubble. And like, I mean, I read the newspaper at night, which mm -hmm. I should, because then it makes it hard to sleep. Um, but you know, I mean, I, I'm aware of what's going on outside, but- but those things don't, don't enter into our day together. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's when, actually really nice. Well, you know, when, when Paul Simon's first child was born, he said that there's this moment that you sit in the hospital bed and everything else becomes nothing at all. Yeah. And I think that when you have young kids, it's so centered around what they're doing and where they are and, you know, all that. But it is this very, very special moment. Yeah. You know, but your, your books also show that life doesn't always go as it plans. Like not everything goes, you shake up your characters a lot in this book and shake up what's going on. You're leaving them off balance and you're taking your readers on a ride with them and they're all off balance together. Yeah. Do you know where you were going with them from the beginning? I mean, you said you just write straight through, but as you were sitting it, you were just ramping it up more. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, you know, I always, I like to fool myself. I think it's very important to fool yourself when you start writing a novel into thinking that you know exactly where you're going. Um, so I always have an outline, a full outline, um, but then things change and you know, you have to allow for that because that's the fun part, you know, that would be like, oh, you know, I, before I knew this character this well, I thought that they would do this, but clearly they're gonna do that. Um, and that's, you know, I think that's where, that's where, I don't know, the most, the most sort of exciting sections in the book or the most exciting turns in the book come, come from for me. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's it, what I love about writing books with a big cast mm -hmm. uh, is that there's always something interesting happening with one of them, you know, <laughs> that like, there is. If you, if you feel like, you know, this one storyline, okay, you kind of know what's going to happen there if you just check in with somebody else um, and it's always the people who you, you know, it, when I, when I start writing a character, like in this, in this book, I would say the two brothers, Elliot and Nikki, who are, um, you know, in the middle of this family, one of them is in Clapham, the other one is in Brooklyn, um, but they're very much connected to what's happening in the book. 
when I started, I didn't, I didn't have a sense of them as well, maybe because they're men or maybe, I don't know. I just, I didn't, I didn't know them as well. But once I started writing, um, I realized that their, their stories were really important mm-hmm. to the family and, and that I had to understand them. And then once I did understand them, um, it just, it just made the book, you know, so much, so much richer. Um, which is great. I mean, that's writing fiction is like, really, it's just the best job. It's just the best job. And you make it so much fun. But here's what's really interesting. You write about a lot about family, but you were an only child growing up. If I'm like, were you not? No, 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 never happened. Wrong about that. Okay. (laughs) No, I have an older brother. Um, He actually, it's my birthday on Saturday and he just sent me this for my birthday. Isn't it lovely? Stunning, stunning. Um, uh, yeah, no, I have an older brother. He's older than I am by three years, um, which meant that he was a, like a senior in high school when I was a freshman in high school. We went to different schools. Um, but it meant that, you know, like his friends were like the coolest people Mm -hmm. in the world. Actually, I was thinking the other day, walking home from the bookstore that, um, about his, like my, you know, cause my older child is six now and I was thinking about my brother's like first best friend who, from about that age, who's really like the first kid, one of the first kids sort of outside my family who I just spent lots and lots and lots of time with. And he and I had the same birthday and I loved him so much. I thought he was the most beautiful creature who ever walked the planet and that I was probably gonna marry him and that it was gonna be so cute because we had the same birthday. Um, yeah, it was, it was a nice, it was a nice little thought. It was a nice uh, little moment. It was yeah. a nice little moment. <laughs> so which character in this book was the easiest to write? Was there somebody who just came to you right away? And then, you know, I'm going to ask which one was the hardest. Well, you know, I, I hmm, okay. Um, I mean, so the, I would say the, the three generations of women in the Strick family, Astrid, who's 68, and the matriarch, and very um prickly Mm -hmm. and then porter who's in her late 30s and pregnant and then cecilia who's 13 who's just been shipped up to asteroids from from brooklyn the three of them i think i i i see as as sort of um you know like a continuous line um Mm -hmm. in this family uh even though Cecilia is a Porter's daughter. She's Portuguese. Um, but I, I loved them. I loved them. And, and to me, like they were the, the sort of heart of the book, watching the three of them navigate life, um, life and love and mm-hmm. pain. Uh, um, it's like yeah. Porter who's had the long time affair with her high school boyfriend to the point where she thinks that the wife is cheating on him. Like, because <laughs> it's her. I mean, it's just very, very, very funny. And she twists things around. I mean, I really love Porter as a character because every time Porter was doing something, it was like kind of crazier than the time before. And I find I wanted her to grow up. Well, at the same time, I was wondering what insane thing she was going to do next because yeah. it was never... And there's this moment which I, we will not give away at the end of the book that is just the best Porter scene. And it's just a great Porter scene. And I feel like we're ramping up to that scene the whole book. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, when I was a kid, I thought that people who were like in their twenties, like really knew, had to, must know what was going on and what their lives were going to be like and have everything figured out. And then when I was in my twenties, I was like, Oh no, no, no. Oh, but people in their thirties must have it figured out. Now I understand that nobody has it figured out ever. Um, but yeah, you know, Porter is in her late thirties and still very much figuring things out. Um, she, uh, but, but I think that at the, at the opening of the book, I mean, and this is not a spoiler, but she, the, the first time you see Porter, you know that she's pregnant and that she has on her own on purpose and that she hasn't told anyone in her family yet. Um, and to me, that meant that like, even though she'd finally like made this choice that like, 
I don't know. It's like the, basically the whole book is like everything she has to get out of her system before she's responsible, um, mm -hmm. before she's responsible for someone else. Um, but yeah, she's, she's a fun one. But it, I mean, to answer your other question about who was harder, you know, I think that her <laughs> supporters, older brother, mm -hmm. um, you know, is the most unlike the rest of his family really just because he's trying, he's just trying really hard. Um, he's just trying really hard to, to sort of prove himself and the other ones don't feel that sort of onus. Um, you know, I, another thing that I was thinking about as I was writing was birth order, mm -hmm. which, which is something that I never really believed in. Um, at all, like I, I just, I thought it was make-believe um, until I had two children and I realized that that birth order has nothing to do with the kid who shows up. It's how the parents treat each kid differently because they have to. I mean, maybe there aren't, gosh. I mean, I would really love like a parenting class from some parents who have figured out how not to do that and how to treat everyone absolutely the same. But, you know, I just, it's, it has proven impossible for me, certainly. Um, you know, my, you know, when my younger child was born, my older one still needed a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. Like I always thought like, oh yeah, people, you know, parents are just more relaxed with the second one, but it's not that it's that the first one is still like, mama, 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 mama. And so <laughs> you have to, um, you know, you, 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 <laughs> you have to pay attention. You have to take it, take care of them. You have yeah. to still take care of them. They're not totally self-sufficient just because he's the older one. Right. Yeah. Oof. Nope. 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 You know, there's a lot of humor, which we, you talked about before in your writing. And a lot of time it sneaks up on me with absolutely perfect timing. I feel like you're doing like, you know, your version of stand up and writing. Is that always there at the start or do you go back and put more humor in, ramp it up? Or no, it's it always there. That's always, always there. there. And that, you know, like, like I, 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 as I said, you know, I sort of, I plot things out or like I make outlines, but you know, the humor that, that, just comes in the writing. I mean, and that's just like me sitting there on, you know, that Tuesday trying to get through this scene, whatever it is, you know, um, that's just me having fun. Well, a lot of the pages that I folded down were the funny pages when I went back and I was like, I just sat there reading and I was like, there's something that happens. I'm always folding down the pages, which is like, you know, terrible to do. But no, it's good. Go back and look, and I go, these are all the funny parts. That's the reason I don't like ebooks because I can't do that for doing an interview again. It'd be really hard. Yeah. But I find that the humor is just so there. But besides the humor in your writing, there's the depth to it as well. And you've written many lines that give me pause as I'm reading your books. And here's one. Sometimes a lie wasn't a lie when it got closer to the truth. Sometimes a lie was more like a wish or a prayer. And I just think that lines like that are the ones that give you pause and they're ones you want to double underline and really sit down. And if you're in a book group, you could just have a conversation about that for a yeah. really long time. Yeah. And I, I appreciate that. You know, it's do you, how do you work on balancing the humor and the seriousness? Is that something you play with as well? Um, no, I mean, you know, I think that that that's just something that happens naturally you know, I think if I was trying to write a different kind of book, mm -hmm. um, like if I was trying to write just like a flat out comedy, I think I would probably have that sort of in mind more where I would be like, okay, so what has to follow this scene? Mm -hmm. has to, mm -hmm. But, but that's like, I mean, to me, that's just really like sinking in and and seeing what happens like that chap. I mean, I don't want to talk too much about that chapter mm -hmm. um, that you read from, but, but to me, like that chapter, like that, that really is one of the chapters in the book that meant the most to me because it's like, it's hard to be honest, you know, it's hard to be honest for t any of us, for all of us about things that are hard you know i mean i i i feel that way as a, a you know 
as a as a friend, as a as a partner, as a parent, as a daughter. Um, you know, like those are the those are the things that are really you know when something is really hard to talk about. Um, sometimes you do pad it in certain mm -hmm. ways to make it easier on the other person. Um, you know, I think that like what I hope is true in my books is that like, and I talked, I talked to my kids about this actually, because my older child, um, vastly prefers nonfiction. Mm. And so we talk about this all the time and I'm like, fiction is great. Come on. Um, and, and what he said, he said, but I like, I like things that are true. I like things that are real. And I said, well, you know, like in this book, it's not like the factually, no, you know, these aren't real people and these things didn't happen, but it is real and it is true. And that is what matters to me. Like, that's what I'm going for. Um, I don't know if he believed me, but. <laughs> it totally makes sense. You know, you have chapter headings throughout the book. Probably not going to get to one page that has one on it now. Why do you do those chapter headings? And do you do those as you write? Because I feel like when I'm reading those, it's like a movie and <laughs> the flash card is going to come up and like, you know, new scene. Yeah. Here's what's happening. Yeah. And I've often wanted to go back and look about how they relate because it was so like, how is this little phrase going to work here? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, sometimes things are just to sort of amuse yourself and I don't know. I just, I liked, I, I mean, I guess that you're right that it did feel, this book does feel sort of cinematic to me. Um, and because I'd been thinking, like I said about the Gilmore girls and like, you know, this, this town sort of as a, as a set almost that people, you know, that I could really move the characters around. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was thinking sort of cinematically and I think that that's why I, I had those like to like little scene announcements. Um, and, and it's and also like you're in charge. It was also like you were in charge. The characters thought they were in charge, but every <laughs> once in a while you got to be in charge. <laughs> the characters are definitely not in charge. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody was moving in the right direction. Yeah. Nobody was moving in the right direction. Um, the final pages talk about ripple effects and we won't get into exactly what those are, but I think that that was something that people, you know, grew up in one place. That's what they see is you're like dropping the pebble in and everything sort of just moves on going forward. It's realized that any action, there's going to be some kind of reaction somewhere along the way. Yeah. And I think that that rap line where you're talking about that, where, um, people just see themselves as insular and that what they do doesn't matter. And it really does sort of pull the whole book together about it really does matter. Every yeah. single thing you're doing matters. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think that it's funny because like, you know, as, as a parent, I, I do like, I feel like the, the, the sort of conventional wisdom that, you know, parents are receiving today is like, don't worry about it so much, you know, it's fine. It's fine. I mean, it's, well, especially right now, you know, sort right. of everything's fine. <laughs> Um, but, but even before this quarantine that, you know, people were like, you know, if you're, if you're worried, it's fine. It's probably fine. Everything's fine. Um, but I do think that, and I, I think that partially this book was me saying like, okay, yes, but also what parent, the choices that parents make do implant themselves in their kids' mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and behaviors and, and, you know, how you are treated by your parents and your family really does affect how you see yourself and that how you see yourself affects the rest of your life, you know? And I think that, um, you know, but, and simultaneously, it's impossible to do everything right, you know? And so, so as, you know, as a, as a human, you have to forgive yourself sometimes for things, even though you know you didn't, oh, you shouldn't have yelled about that, but it's all right. You know, you have to, you have to move on. And, and, and I think that like really the point of the book is, is that, you know, it's okay because we're all still trying, you know, mm -hmm. none of us 
are ever done. You know, I, 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 I feel so much more aware now that my parents who were in their mid to late seventies, they're not done either. You know, like they're, they're still evolving. They're still evolving. Things are still happening along the way. When something happens, like what's going on right now, how people react, what yeah. people do, you see people differently. Yeah. Also a lot starts to not matter. It's like yeah. just not a big deal. This is yeah. just, not what we really need to worry about. You know, something I know is you like audiobooks. You enjoy listening on audio. Do you read your book aloud at any point? Do you ever do that just to hear the cadence or anything? Yeah, I do. Um, I do. Like, I'm, I, I'm not one of those people. I don't read it from start to finish ever aloud. Um, but I definitely read to myself sort of as I go. Um, and then when I don't, like sometimes when I have a book come out like this, um, I'll, I'll, I'll try, I'll be like, Oh, what reading should I do? And I'll read and I'll be like, Oh, wow. I must not have read that part aloud because that I should have fixed that. I should have changed this sentence, you know, but I think that's the reason they don't like authors to read their own audio books. Yeah. Like, well, let me just make this change. Oh, you, you would know. be, I would be rewriting the whole time for sure. It's like totally not good. Um, you own a bookstore, you own Books or Magic, which is an amazing bookstore. And it's just, you know, wonderful that you're doing this. And I'm wondering that besides the fact that you have less time in your life because you own a bookstore, has it influenced your writing at all? Have, have you become any kind of a different writer? Because this is the first book that's come out since you own the bookstore. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know if it's made me a different writer, but it's, it's, it's made me a better reader. Mm -hmm. Um, like I feel just more aware of more books and, you know, books just fall into my lap all day long, every day. Um, and that's all to the good. You know, I think that I, I feel, um, I think it would be really easy to have a bookstore <laughs> and, um, think, oh God, like there are so many books published every week why bother? Um, but I feel like, you know, it is, it is equally possible to just feel inspired and, mm -hmm. and to feel, um, just lucky. You know, I feel lucky. The bookstore makes me feel lucky really, because I just, I get to, not only do I get, you know, galleys six months ahead for every book that is published. Um, but, but, but then I also get the, all these writers in my space and I get to talk to them and to listen to them. Um, that's really the best part. And I think that if anything has made me a better writer in the last four years, it's, it's that I've had a lot of opportunities to listen to other writers. Yeah. It's a lot of inspiration all day long. It's a, and you do a lot of events at your store. In a typical, you know, month, you're doing a lot of events, a couple of days sometimes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Even now. Yeah. <laughs> just keep doing those Zoom events. Just yeah. keep doing everything. We Zoom, we do whatever. Yeah. Um, it was four years between Modern Love and this book. Are we, is it going to be four years again, or do you have an idea percolating? I sure or? hope not. I, sure hope not. Um, I have a deadline that is sooner than that, so... <laughs> <laughs> Children, color. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. School helps. I mean, you know, if we can get back to school, then I should be okay. Yeah, there's these chunks of the day that normally we're not seeing the little people, you know, not seeing them around. Yeah. I am so excited about this book. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I think that there, for everybody who's looking for some kind of a laugh, there are a lot of very, very funny moments. And it's really smart, sophisticated humor that you're going to just sit there and want to go talk to somebody about. Oh, so yeah. I hope that people do that. It's a good book club book because there's a lot to discuss. There's a lot to, you know, move around and talk about families and talk about your own lives as well. So I congratulate you. It's Thanks. another book. I'm so happy for you. I know this is like the craziest time to be having a book come out. We're going to do everything to make sure we've got readers reading and just thanks for joining us tonight. It's always so much fun to talk to you, even when it's just in the lobby of a hotel and I'm glad we got longer tonight. Great. Thank you so much, Carol. I really, I really appreciate it. You know, I think that it is a weird time to publish a book, um, but, but I really, all right. My dad just texted me and said, yep, several goldfish. I don't know what that is about, um, but it, 
you know, I, I actually, and I think I can say this like honestly, just as a bookseller, that I think that this book actually will make people happy right now. You know, that like, I actually, I feel like it might offer a little joy and solace um, in this really scary time. So I hope, I hope, I hope people, people read it and like it and that it. There are many wines that will do that. And there's many (laughs) thinking about the families that will do that because I think people will be writing their own scenarios in their head as they're reading this. And I think that also people are going to forgive themselves for a lot of things because it's really okay to let it go. Yeah. Yeah. I hope so. (laughs) Thank you, Carol. Thanks so much. Always great to see you. And to our readers, till next time. 